say in Matthew 18 and 20, where two or three are gathered in your name, that you are in the midst of us. And we thank you for being with us every step of the way. And I ask that you continue to watch over us and watch over this lesson as James brings this wonderful word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Uh, last week we were in Genesis chapter 10, and we're going to kind of start off with a uh, brief, uh, I guess, resumptive, uh, what do you call it, summary. The first king, queen, prince, and princess in scripture were black from the line or the descendants of Ham. The first king in the Bible in Genesis chapter 10, it mentions him. His name was Nimrod. He was Ham's grandson by Ham's son Cush, whose name means Ethiopia in English. And the first queen in the Bible, of course, was the queen of Sheba in first kings. And she was the one who traveled 1500 miles with her caravan, caravan to meet King Solomon. And uh, they had a child by the name of Menelik. And when Solomon found that he did have a son because his wives were just producing him females, uh, he wanted to make that boy king of uh, Israel. And the people there did not want him to rule. He didn't want to rule there. So he went back to Ethiopia. And Solomon took uh, 1,000 of the choicest men from each of the 12 tribes of Israel to go down to Ethiopia with him to help him reign when he would assume the throne of his mother, the Queen of Sheba, uh, the Queen of Ethiopia, as the uh, Jewish historian Flavius Josephus called her. And uh, this is how we have Black Jews in Ethiopia today. They're known as the Falasha. And back in the 1980s, I believe, uh, before President George Bush the first became president, he, he had a uh, escape plan for the Jews in Ethiopia that was called the Operation Sheba, where he airlifted uh, Ethiopian Jews back to their homeland in Israel. And then later on, there was another airlift uh, during the famine of uh, that was going on when they had the We Are the World campaign. And they, they airlifted a lot of other Ethiopian Jews back to Israel, uh, where they were instated there as full-fledged Jews. So they, uh, the white Jews of the day, acknowledge that uh, they do have African lines of uh, Jews. And as quiet as it's kept, the uh, African line of Jews is older than the European line of Jews. As we must remember that Moses was uh, born in Africa. And when Joseph summoned all of the children of Israel into Africa, all the Jews in the world, they totaled 70, according to Genesis chapter 46. And it gives their names and their sexes. And only two of them were female. One was raped by the first uh, prince in scripture. He was a Canaanite prince. And according to Genesis 9, 18, Ham is the father of Cana. His name was Shechem. He was a Havite, descendant of the Canaanites of Ham. And he had raped Dinah, which was Joseph's sister. So she was defiled. And the only other Hebrew female that accompanied them to Africa to sweat out that famine was named Sarah. And she was born of uh, Jacob or Israel's son named Asher by a concubine who was also a black female. So in order for the Hebrews, all 70 Hebrews to have kept their bloodline pure, they would have had to meet, they would have had to have mated with the, uh, with Sarah. And there were 56 bachelors, not counting the 12 founding fathers of Israel. So she couldn't have lived long enough to produce uh, the purity of the bloodline of Hebrews. So in order for the children of Israel to have survived the 400 years they were in Africa, they had to marry women of ancient Egypt, which is called the land of Ham in Psalms 105.23 and 106.22. So when they came out of Egypt, when Moses led them out of Egypt, remember he himself was passing as a Hamite, uh, the greatest king in Africa's grandson, he was passing as a black man until he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. She was a princess 
Again, all the first king in the Bible was black. Queen of Sheba was black. Prince uh, Shechem was black. And now the princess, which was the uh, king of Africa's daughter, the greatest king in Africa's daughter, Pharaoh's daughter, who was bathing in the river Nile, who found Moses, she was the princess who was also a descendant of Ham Black. So all the black royalty in scripture uh, are all what color? Black, 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 black. black. So we are, uh, we've been duped by television. We've been duped by propaganda. We've been duped by Michelangelo's paintings of all these white characters in scripture. Because when you look in Genesis chapter 10, uh, the first three verses, maybe four verses, five verses, that's where the sons of Japheth are listed. Then they're listed again in Ezekiel. And uh, Alexander the Great is prophesied in Daniel chapter 8. And that's the end of them. None of them are given speaking parts, not even Japheth, Noah's eldest son, the father of the Europeans, was not giving a speaking part. The Holy Spirit saw the racism that was to come and did not allow them to even have a part or parcel. So when they talk about, oh, uh, if, you're, if you got one drop of black blood in you, then you're black, then they must acknowledge that Egypt is called the land of Ham. So that movie with Cecil B. DeMille's produced called the Ten Commandments with the white Pharaoh there was not scriptural whatsoever because the land of Ham was filled with Hamites and the Europeans had no speaking parts in any of the 39 books of the Old Testament. Therefore, there were no Ashkenazi Jews or white European Jews in the Old Testament. Why? Because the white Europeans were not in the biblical lands that were giving any speaking parts or any, any character parts in scripture. So today we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 10 real quick, uh, where it talks about the sons of Ham, verse 6. And the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Foot, and Cana. Now again, because of racism, white people from the British Isles who translated the King James Bible for King James, a slave trader, that's where we get the name Jamestown and uh, the first slaves were sold in America in 1619. This book was written in 1611. You have a King James version of the Bible. Uh, they hid the names of Ham's sons in Hebrew. They did not translate them into English. So you might want to write these uh, names above Ham's sons' names if you want to have uh, current English translation. Cush is Hebrew for Ethiopia in English. Mizraim is Hebrew for Egypt, Ham's second son in English. Foot, from where we get the Phoenicians um, of Libya, is Libya in English. And the person, we, they kept the name the same because he was a slave of slaves, was who? Cana, Cana's land. So when you talk about Israelites being promised the land of Cana, they're being promised the land of a black man, okay? When you talk about the Israelites going down into Egypt, North Africa, what do white theologians call it? They do not call it North Africa. When I was a child, they would call Egypt the Orient, the Orient. Orient means East. If you look at an African map, you will find that Egypt is in North Africa, not in the East, okay? But this is the racism, the madness of racism that they have going on in their minds. And not only that, when you look at uh, uh, the today's theologians, I just graduated from uh, Dallas Theological Seminary with a master's degree. And today's theologians, they decided not to call it the Orient anymore. They don't call it North Africa. They, Africa is just a, a foreign a curse word to their lips. So they call Egypt the ancient Near East. So anything to deprive or decry or to decimate or to downgrade or denigrate the children of Ham, that's what they do. That's what they do. So when it comes to whites talking to you about blacks in scripture, it will always be negative. It will never be positive, even though the Garden of Eden uh, came straight out of Africa with Nubia being the land of gold, meaning the land of gold, which is, they translated Havilah instead of Nubia. And the gold of that land is good. And even the word Havilah was a grandson of Ham. But they try to 
credit it with Shem. Uh, the Shem's Havilah was in the east, Ham's were in Africa. And the second portion of the Garden of Eden was in Ethiopia. Look it up in Genesis chapter 2, verse 13. And it talks about the river that went out of Eden and surrounded the whole land of Ethiopia and the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. We would know that as Nubia today. So these are the what these are the tricks that they play, their white races played in order to enslave us, and it really tricked them up in the end. We're going to continue to read, and it says, Cush, or Ethiopia, verse 8, begat Nimrod. Now, Cush was the son of Ham. He begat Nimrod, so that makes Nimrod Ham's grandson. And he, Nimrod, began to be a mighty one in the earth. So who was the first mighty man in the earth after Adam? A black man. The word Cush means black. Uh, Ethiopian, Ethiopia is what it's called in English, and it means burnt face, of burnt face. So this black man began to be a what one? A mighty one in the earth. Now, when we come, what did I, what did I tell you? When it comes to black people, because of the history of historic racism, what is the word that in white culture is a name that they call each other when they don't like someone? You Nimrod. You Nimrod, why do they do that? Because they're again castigating the children of Ham. Should a person, if you were mad at somebody, would you call them a mighty one in the earth? No. No. They take that and they try to denigrate and desecrate and diminish any black accomplishment that the scripture has set forth. So if you are going against scripture, are you a child of God or a child of Satan? We don't even need well, to answer yeah. that. So we're, going to, so we're going to continue. Here Nimrod is a mighty man <clears throat> in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, <clears throat> in seminary, where they train uh, ministers to become the agents that hold up the values of white America and uh, European America, uh, your Europeans, they teach you that Nimrod was a hunter of men before the Lord. He hunted men. If he was hunted before the Lord, would the Lord honor him? Would the Lord honor a murderer? No. So you must always go to what Galatians chapter 4, verse 30 says, and ask the question, nevertheless, what saith the scripture? What does the scripture say about Nimrod? He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. This means his name was symbolic of champions. This name was symbolic of something noble before the Lord, okay? He was not a hunter of men, a killer of men. Why do whites say that? Because anything that supports white supremacy, racist, want. Anything that gives power to white supremacy and diminishes other races, that's what many of the racists are into. Are all whites racist? Not at all. But the ones that are, they generally get a pen and they begin writing things that desecrate, denigrate, or delete the black history that is in scripture. And the woods is full of them. Then the uh, verse 10, it says, and the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom or his kingdom was Babel. And right there, the Bible tells us the role that Nimrod played. He was the role of the king, a king. He is the first king in scripture. This is the first place in scripture where it talks about a kingdom. In order to have a kingdom, you must have a king. He and being the mighty one before the Lord was king of the earth. Now, Although Nimrod here, he was honored before the Lord, just like King Solomon was honored before the Lord. Both Nimrod and Solomon, they started off in high favor, but they both ended up as types of the Antichrist, the Antichrist. The Antichrist in our last days were moving uh, from the legs of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar that were iron. Iron is a black metal. 
and it is the longest part on that statue's body. The longest part on your body are your legs. And this is the Greco-Roman Empire, white supremacist rule in this dark age, being the age of iron. It's a dark age. They call it the age of enlightenment. Again, nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Everything is upside down when it comes to the human mind of natural men. We are right now in the dark age with racism, white supremacy ruling, and the Greco-Roman Empire took over after the uh, belly of brass, Alexander the Great brought the his leadership of a one world ruler over the earth. When he conquered all the known worlds, then he died and his four generals took over and they became the Greco-Romans. And right now we have the Europeans have been ruling primarily, except for the Ottomans for a time, for the last 2000 years, okay? And this is during the times of the Gentiles when God, after he released the children of Israel out of African bondage, out of African slavery, out of race-based slavery that began in Africa, perpetrated on his Hebrew people by Africans of Ham, okay? Because remember, God said, I'd raised up Pharaoh for this purpose, that my glory might be made known. When the first Pharaoh brought down the Hebrews, brought them into the land from the land of Cana into North Africa, ancient Egypt, the land of Ham, they were given the best land, the land of Ramesses, the land of Goshen, the Bible calls it. And they were given the best land. And God always told them, remember how you were treated when the Egyptians welcomed you into their land. That's how you should treat your strangers. Are they treating the Palestinians that way? No, they're persecuting them. So they're, they're still in rebellion against the Lord, their God. But when the Africans received them, they gave them the best land. They gave uh, Joseph, who was not a Hamite, he was a Shemite. They promoted him to the uh, top of the nation, right next to Pharaoh himself as the vice Pharaoh or viceroy of Egypt because it's not based upon, in black culture, it's not based upon color, it's based upon your ability. In white society, it's based upon color. They would prefer Jeffrey Dahmer to live beside them than Martin Luther King, okay? That's just the madness of racism. Not based upon the content of character. And you go to the historical roots of this, when you look at black culture, who do black people reference? We reference uh, people that have morals. We re reverence Mahatma Gandhi. We reverence uh, our wise men, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King. In white culture, who do they reverence? They reverence their murderers. They reverence George Washington, the slaughter of Indians, the slaughter of the British. They reverence, uh, they were going to reverence Hitler had he won. They reverence Alexander the Great. You know, he's conquering people. They reverence power power might make right okay until they came into christianity and they were like wait a minute we need to rethink this and they became out of paganism which is a non-abraham based belief system into the abrahamic belief systems of judaism christianity and islam if you're in a religion opposite of those three then you're in a pagan religion in in white paganism they reverence military might might makes right you know, carry the big stick, not their wise men. They don't reference their wise men. You can't even hardly talk about their wise men except Plato, Aristotle, uh, people way back when. Then when you read their writings, they're talking about slavery. Slavery. People are natural slaves, according to Aristotle. There's natural slaves. And at that time, uh, he was talking about white people. Okay. So we have to get past their madness of racism. Because again, the Bible says that when during the times of the Gentiles, when the Hebrews are going to be oppressed by uh, the Gentiles of the world, it began at Babel 1 with Nebuchadnezzar. Now, again, look in verse 10 of chapter 10. The beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel, which is Babylon. The person who inherited Babylon or Babel or Babylon was Nebuchadnezzar. He was the head of gold. And God told him, after you, every kingdom age that succeeds you will be inferior. He uses that word in 
Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 39, inferior to your kingdom. Why? Because in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, remember, he went to the Hebrews and got the best and the brightest and put them and gave them educations and put them over their people to rule. Okay. And we're going to learn about Nimrod's rulership. His rulership was greater than Nebuchadnezzar's. If Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold, Nimrod was the head of platinum, was the crown of platinum. Why? Because God himself had to come down out of heaven and dethrone the kingdom and overthrow the kingdom that Nimrod had set up because he did what? He was like the Antichrist. He's going to bring the world under a one world rule. Remember when the Antichrist comes in, the Bible says by peace shall he deceive many. In Nimrod's kingdom, he went and took Eric, Akkad, and Kalnath and in the land of Shinar, which is the land of Sumner, where we get the Sumerians, who were the first people to do what? Write language. The first written words were written by Black people. They were the Samaritans. They were the Sumerians. They were the uh, Akkadians. And if you look them up, they called themselves the Blackheads. Now, when whites get it, they're the last on the scene. They want to make everything about them. They will tell you, oh, it didn't mean they were black-headed or black-haired. It meant they were black-haired. No. The whole world is black-haired except for them. All the Chinese are black-haired. All the Africans are black-haired. All the Mexicans are black-haired. The only people that don't have black hair is them. So it's not about black hair. That's not a distinguishing, that's not a distinguishing uh, characteristic. They said, these are black-headed people. And these were the people who were ruling. Now, I'm going to share with you what, now what they talk about. When they got to Nimrod, they always call each other, you Nimrod, which means you dumb, oafish caveman. Or you Philistine. You're just a Philistine. You're just a big, like Goliath, a big dummy. Well, I want you to look back in Genesis chapter 10, where the Philistines come from. Again, it says in verse 6 that these are the sons of Ham. And then it says the uh, second son's name was Mizraim. We're going to drop down to where Mizraim had his children, and it talks about, <clears throat> let me see, look down at uh, 13. And Mizraim began Ludan and Anamin and Lahabin and Naphtilim and Perishim and Kashlunim. And verse 14, it says, out of whom came who? Philistim, the Philistines. So when they call people, you Nimrod, they're calling you a black person. They call you uh, the N-word, basically. And when they call the people, you Philistine, they're talking about our race, okay? These are the races of Ham. So again, when you start listening to these things, be cognizant because they don't even know that they're being racist because it's just so systemic. It's so in the system of this system of white supremacy that it just goes undetected. So when they call each other, you Philistine, you'll hear them say that. Or I heard um, Harvey Levin on his uh, TMZ say, oh, he was just a ham there. You know, and, you know, why do they say he just hamming it up? These are not just words. To ham it up means it's over the top. And when you look at ancient Egypt, what do you see when you see the pyramid? The pyramid is a sepulcher or a grave of one of the great kings in Africa. And it's over the top. When you look at their temples of Luxor, if you go there, that thing dwarfed Solomon's temple in grandeur. It was bigger than Solomon's temple. It was more beautiful than Solomon's temple because the things of the world are more noble than the children of light. And this is where we get the word luxurious from this black people's temple in ancient Egypt the land of Ham. But before they give credit to a Black person or a Black ingenuity for creating Luxor temples or creating the pyramids of Egypt, what do they say? Oh, there must have been aliens from outer space because racism is madness, okay? Racism is madness. Again, they came from us, but they always ask, were there any black people in the Bible? Okay, someone's going to have some phones, please. 
And if you have your, if you're on your phone, mom, turn your phone off. Thank you. Uh, anytime you have a situation where they are, you know, decrying black people, it's because of the racism that has been inculcated in them and they pass it on to their generations. It's only when they renew their minds with the word of God that they will stop that foolishness. When you hear about Nimrod, white theologians try to paint Nimrod as a bloodthirsty dictator who is dictating what is to be built. So let's go to uh, Numbers, not Numbers, but the 11th chapter of uh, Genesis to understand what the Bible says and not what white people say. They are not God. They are not God. It says the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as the people of the earth came off the ark and they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Sumar or Sumner or Shinar. And there they dwelt. And they said to one another, did Nimrod say? No. They said to one another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they mm -hmm. had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us. No, notice this. These are, <laughs> I mean, when you're hearing this us, us, Whites don't fill you in of who's talking. Let us mm. make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which means Yahweh came down, or Jehovah came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people is what? One. And they have all one language. And this they begin to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Do you hear what he says? God is saying, when you're on one accord, working as one, nothing can be restrained from you which you can imagine to do. So what does God say? Let us go down. Who's us? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us go down there and confound their language. And same us who said, let us make man in our own image. Images, plural? No. Image, singular. Because we are in the image of God, spirit, soul, and body. And God is three in one. Let us go down and there confound their language and they, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore, the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Do you see Nimrod hunting men? If Nimrod was hunting men, would they all be of one? Would they all be one? See, when you add to God's word, the Bible says, add not thou to his word, Proverbs 30, verse 6, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a what? A liar. Now, white people will say, no, this Nimrod is Sargon of Agad. And they start lying and talk about, see, we got a shovel out and we went outside the Bible, and we found this guy named Sargon of Agad. Now, Sargon of Agad was from the line of Shem. What did the Bible say that uh, the lineage that Nimrod was from? Ham. And if you don't know scripture, and because somebody has a, a paper that a white person gave them about the Bible that I know more than you do, you'll be a fool and believe them. The word of God holds the authority, not man's PhDs, not my master's degree. The word of God is the authority. And where you will find it, they will take from the word of God, manipulate it in new Bibles to hide black history and to change black history and to change history so that they can write a thesis and be somewhat among men. That's where we are today. 
That's how sick religion has become today. They try to make Nimrod, Ham's grandson, a bloody dictator. But did it say that he dictated what was going to be built of that city? It said, let us make us this. Now they want to go to these extra biblical resources. So let us go to the extra biblical resource that the Bible tells us to go to. In Joshua chapter 10, verse 13, it says, is this not written in the book of Jasher? So I'm going to share with you what is written in the book of Jasher, and I want, let's see here, is, uh, let's see, can y'all see this? Yes. You can? Okay. It says, the book of Jasher provides this account of Nimrod's ascent to power after God honored him for the great sacrifices he brought to the Lord upon his success in subduing warmongering Japhethites, Noah's eldest son, the Caucasians, uh, later to be known as Europeans. The account is written of in the ninth chapter of the book of Jasher, uh, and in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 18, it says, is it not written in the book of Jasher? The book of Jasher is a history book for the Bible. It says, when Nimrod was 40 years old, at that time there was war between his brethren, Hamites, and the children of Japheth, later to be known as Caucasians or Europeans, so that the Hamites were in power over, uh, it were in the power of their enemies. And Nimrod went forth at that time and he assembled all the sons of Cush. Cush again means what? Ethiopians. Ethiopia. And their families. And he went with them to battle. And Nimrod strengthened the hearts of the people that went with him. And he said to them, do not fear, neither be alarmed for our enemies, Japheth's kindred, uh, later to be called the Europeans, will be delivered into our hands and you may do with them as you please. And they fought against their enemies and they destroyed them and they did what? Subdued them and Nimrod placed standing officers over them in their respective places. Now, when you hear about the book of Jasher, do you hear white people talk about, let's read the book of Jasher? Never. They put, no, the book of Jasher, you can't believe that book. You can't believe that book. Why? Because it's elevating the status of who? Nimrod, whom they hate. Why do they hate Nimrod? Because he subjected their people. And let's continue to read. And they fought against their enemies, and they destroyed them and subdued them. And Nimrod placed standing officers over them in their respective places, and he took some of their children as security. And they were all servants to, or slaves to, Nimrod and his brethren, who were what? Ethiopians. And Nimrod and all the people that were with him turned homeward. And when Nimrod had joyfully returned from battle, having conquered his enemies, enemies, Japheth's descendants, later to be known as the Caucasoids, all of his brethren, Hamites, together with those who knew him before, the Shemites, assembled to make him king over them, and they placed the regal crown upon his head, Jasher chapter, chapter 7, verses 36 through 40. And King Nimrod reigned securely, and all the earth was under his what? Control. Control. He was symbolic of the who? Antichrist. And all the earth was of one tongue and words of union. And all the princes or sons of Nimrod and his great men took counsel. Who were his great men? His uncles, who was Foot, whose name was what? Libya, Mizraim, Libya. his uncle, Egypt, and Egypt. his daddy, Ethiopia, and Cana, and their families of Hamites. And they said to each other, Come, let us build ourselves a city, and in it, a strong what? Tower. Now, have you no. ever heard that this was a black idea? That the Tower of Babel was a black man's idea? Oh. Never. And you never will until you get the book, The Complete History of Blacks in the Bible, that I've written. It's available on Amazon.com. <clears throat> now, this is all in the book of Jasher that whites decry. Do not read that book. They want you to read their books where they talk about Nimrod married his mother. Now, it's because he's, he, Nimrod married his mother, Serenus, in this book called The Two Babylons. Now, listen, after God dispersed men throughout the earth, Nimrod's daddy was still living. Again, Nimrod's dad's name in English is what? Ethiopia. Don't we have the land of Ethiopia over there right now? 
do you think that Nimrod was the youngest child of Cush or Ethiopia? And do you think his brothers would have let his let their baby brother marry their mother as white theologians want you to believe and teach in seminaries? No, no, it'd be, it's illogical, but that's what they do and that's what they are teaching. And this is what is in their books, read it for yourself and the two Babylons. And I went to seminary and they still produce and promote this type of mess to the seminary students who lap it up if they don't read the scriptures and find out what's going on. It refers you to the book of Jasher. Let's continue to read. So these black people got together and said, come let us build us a city and a tower, a strong tower and its top reaching unto heaven that we, uh, and we will make ourselves famed, make a name for themselves. That's where the Antichrist wants you to do. Put his name in your what? Forehead and in your wrist or on your hand so that you can't move without his say so. Again, he's symbolic of the Antichrist. Uh, then it says here, they said to us, come let us build us a city and a tower that's top reach into heaven that we may make ourselves famed so that we may reign upon the whole earth in order that the evil of our enemies, Japheth's descendants, later to be known as Caucasians, may cease from us that we may reign mightily over them and that we may not be scattered over the earth on account of their wars, their warmongering people. What are they doing today? Russia is, 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 is attacking former Russians. Uh, and where? The Ukraine, Crimea, and all these things here. <clears throat> and they all, Hamites, went before King Nimrod, and they told the king these words, and the, cream, the king agreed with them in this affair, and he did so. Now, in that above passage, Nimrod to do the children of Japheth in order that the evil of their enemies, Japheth's descendants, will cease from them, that they might reign mightily over them, and that they may not become scattered throughout the earth. Thus, the Tower of Babel was a, a Hamite idea. Now, when you, have you ever heard of such a thing? Does the church pastors teach such a thing? Why? Because they do not study to do what? Show themselves approved. So when we look at it, what did God do to Nimrod's kingdom to stop it? He interrupted its communication system. He interrupted Nimrod's communication system by doing what to the languages? Confusing the languages. So because of a black man's rulership in his land of Babylon, we have all of these plethora of languages today, Greek, Hebrew, Syriac, Portuguese, Spanish, English, German, on, 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 all because of what? All because of one black man. And when God came down and confused the languages, whose language out of the Shemites, Hamites, and Japheth's people, whose language did he confuse the most so that this would not reemerge? The language of Hamites. If you go to Africa, you have over 1,500 to 2,000 languages there. If you go to India, where they have the Kush, Kush being Ethiopia, Kush Hindu mountain range, how many languages are there? Over 270, okay? So God made sure that uh, black people, y'all can, y'all get, I gotta keep y'all down because what? You were the ones who were of superior strength to do what? To bring the world together Right now in America, what do they say? Black people can't work together. Black people can't work together. That's a lie. Because when we work together, what did God have to do? God didn't even have the plan of salvation in the earth. After God saw that, what did he do? In the next chapter, he got busy and chose Abraham, a Gentile out, and called him out and started putting the plan of salvation in work in the earth. Okay? This black man got God moving. He came down, what is man doing? Come let us do it. We can't let this happen. This will destroy the whole system. So to restrain mankind, God brought uh, multiple languages in the earth to disrupt mankind's communication system, okay? So when 
you look in scripture, if you go to the older, the older dictionaries and you find out we're under the governmental form called a democracy, where we have uh, representatives uh, represent us in this democratic form of government. This is the second best form of government there is in the world, according to the scripture. The first best form uh, that the Bible puts forth is Nimrod's form of government. And when you look it up in the old dictionaries, it's called a hamocracy, a hamocracy, okay? It's a hamocratic form of government. And it's described as, is characterized as a pluralistic rule of the people, by the people, for the people. It's kind of like as Nimrod's kingdom, when all the black guys got together and said, hey, let us build a tower in us a city so that we can reign mildly over the people. Uh, it's gonna be for us, by us. They were the original who? Fubus, okay? The original Fubus. These were black people. Again, in Webster's new universal unabridged dictionary, it defines democratic form of government is a government characterized by the mutual actions of people ruling together with one another as it states that the people were one, acting as one and of one mind, okay? This is the same as the sharing of the rule. If you remember Abraham Lincoln, it says, any government that is of the people, by the people and for the people shall not perish from this earth. And it's true. So God himself had to come down and do what? Disrupt this democratic form of government. Remember, the name Ham means village or nation. When you talk about Buckingham, it means the village of Bucking. Or Nottingham, the village of Notting. Or Hamlet, little village. So when Abram made it with uh, a Hamite, and God said, your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham, for a father of a multitude of villages or nations or cities, shall you be. Nationality shall you be. This is all based on the name of who? Shem? No. Japheth? No. Ham. Abraham, democratic form of government, hamocracy. Now, do you get any of this from a white seminary? No, no. They're, bet, they're bedfellows with white supremacy racism, okay? Again, in white culture, the word Nimrod is a curse word. They call each other that, you Nimrod. Now, when it talks, the, they say, well, it's Sargon of Gay Agad was really Nimrod. But when you look up Sargon of Agad, they have a quote from him, and it says this, I am Sargon the mighty, king of Agad. And my mother was a lowly commoner, and my father I know not. The black-headed people I rule. Wait a minute. Sargon of Agad did not know his father, but the scripture says in Genesis chapter 10, verse 8, that Nimrod's father was who? Cush. So they could not be the same people. Do you understand? Uh -huh. The most dangerous thing to accurate Bible scholarship is Eurocentrism and Christianity. Why? Because it's a bedfellow of racism, white supremacy. Okay? Okay. Now, Nimrod was symbolic of the king of the, as the king of the world. Who does the Bible state is the king of the world right now or the God of this world right now? Satan. Satan. And in Nimrod, they wanted to make a tower that, and, and the gates, it was called Bavol, uh, a gate of heaven to get into heaven's gates by the works of their flesh. Is God allowing anybody into heaven based upon their goodness, their oneness, their uprightness. No, you only go to heaven through one way and Jesus Christ says that I am the door. You're not getting there because you've built up so many good works and your good works a lot way your bad works. Your works don't work because the Bible says there's none that doeth good because even with the temple, it says when you put your tool on it, you defiled it. When you put your good works to the works of Jesus Christ, his finished work of the cross, you defiled it. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, if anyone tries to mix law and grace, Christ profits that person nothing. When we go to our churches, what are they doing? 
They're mixing law and grace. If you are a good person and you accept Jesus, you go to heaven. No, there's nothing to do with good. You got to confess yourself as a what? A sinner who cannot cease from sin. And then what does God do you? He gives you the divine nature of his son who cannot sin because he was born of God and adopts your soul into his family. Does that mean you're going to stop sinning? No. Human nature is the nature of sin. Romans 7.25 says, my flesh, Paul said, the greatest apostle there ever was, I find this law in my members. With my mind, the mind of Christ, I serve the law of God. But with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. So when we find Nimrod at the end of his kingdom, who put an end to Nimrod's kingdom rule? God himself. Who's going to put an end to the Antichrist rule when he has a one world government, when he becomes a mighty one in the earth that you must, he makes a name for himself. He wants your name in, his, in, your, in your forehead. He wants his mark on your forehead. He wants a number of his name on your palm. He wants to be famous. Who's going to put him down? The son of God. The son of God. So when we look at these things, we have to always remember what, what, what Jesus Christ said. Moses was writing about me. And when Moses was writing about these things, you got your phone on? Please mute your phone. Whoever has a phone out there, please mute it. When Moses was writing about these things, he says, uh, Jesus Christ says he was writing about me. So when we look in the book of Genesis and we find uh, Eve talking to a serpent, Jesus said Moses was writing about who? Jesus Christ. So we have to look at it in these two ways. Either it's a type of Christ or it's a type of the Antichrist, Satan. So when we see Adam and Eve talking to a serpent, that's a type of the Antichrist that says, hath God said? And the answer is, uh, that's not God's word. That's what the Satan will always say. Don't trust the Bible. Trust our writings, theologians. Don't trust the Bible. That's a mistranslation. Trust my words that I got from this university. You can trust me and not God's word. And that's where we're at today. And that's why Christianity is going down, down, and down. The Bible says, as Moses, so when we look at that serpent in, in that's trying to talk Eve into sin and death, that is a type of the Antichrist who takes you away from the word of God. Now, in the book of Genesis and in the book of Exodus, we find that Jesus Christ is typed as a serpent. How, do, how does that happen? Remember that Jesus Christ said, as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness on a pole, so must the Son of Man be lifted up on a tree. So, and also, remember when Jesus Christ appeared before Pharaoh, the greatest king in Africa, and uh, Moses appeared before Pharaoh, the greatest king in Africa, and threw down his serpent, and threw down his rod, and it became a serpent? That serpent was symbolic of who? That serpent of the pole, that serpent was symbolic of Jesus Christ. What did Pharaoh do? Because Satan's always trying to imitate the things of God. He had his two ministers throw down their rods, and they also became serpents. But what did the Hebrews' rod or serpent do to the other serpents? Swallow them up. And that was a type and a shadow of how Jesus Christ on the cross was going to swallow up death and hell, okay? So we have to look at all the time, every time you look at the Old Testament writings of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Jesus Christ said, Moses wrote, if you believe Moses, you would have believed me because Moses was writing about me. These are not just stories. You got to put them, put your glasses of Jesus on and see what's going on. When the children of Israel are going through the Red Sea, the Red Sea is here. The children of Israel are going this way. So what do you see? You see the cross. You've got to put your, and then what is the Red Sea symbolic of? Red is symbolic of what? 
Blood. Blood. So the New Testament's Red Sea is the blood of who? Jesus Christ. So you got it. That washes away sin. The Old Testament rest, Red Sea washed away Pharaoh and his army. The New Testament Red Sea washed away the devil and your old man. You were crucified with Christ. So you've always got to put the lenses of the New Testament on when reading the books of Moses, which is called the Torah or the Pentateuch. How does a person get saved? Only two things are required. What are they? Faith and work. Faith and works. Faith in yourself? Turning from your evil ways? No, that's religion. Faith in who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Because you are evil. You don't turn away from yourself. You are evil. Can evil turn away from evil? No. Christ said you being evil, not that you act evil. You being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. You are an evil being, okay? Humans are evil beings. If I was to monitor your thoughts throughout the day, I would see a whole lot of evil thoughts. Look what she's wearing. She thinks she's cute. Ooh, ooh, look how cute she is. Blah, 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 blah. Evil thoughts. These are our, this is our nature before God. It's called what nature? Human nature. It is the nature of sin. So what does God do for us to give us, to get us saved? He takes, he, he leaves the human nature in you. You're going to have the nature of sin in you to the day you die. He just imbues you with the divine nature of Christ in you which is the mystery of your godliness, Christ in you, the hope of glory. How does he get in you? He's born in you at the new birth. The new birth is not you recycling yourself to become some new creature. No, the new birth is the new creation of Christ being born into your heart by faith. The new creation is the spirit of Christ being born into your heart by faith when you believe the gospel. What is the gospel? What is the good news? The good news. Okay. Use your computer for giving the plan of salvation and Satan will use anything to disrupt this part of the scriptures. In order for to be saved, what must you do? You must have the seed of Christ in you. How does that seed of Christ get into you? It's born of God through the gospel. The Bible says you've been begotten unto a lively hope by the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is good news. The good news is that you don't have to be good to be saved. Christ mm -hmm. died for the ungodly. You can't be good. There is none that doeth good. In your flesh dwells no good thing. So what, can, what good can you bring to God for him to accept you? You must bring the offering that God gave you to bring him which is the offering of his son's death, blood, and resurrection. Nothing in my hands, I plead, simply to the cross I cling. Jesus, you died for my sins, to take away my sins in the sight of God, to give me eternal life, to give me your righteousness, your holiness, your perfection before the almighty God. So when I stand before you, I will not stand there in my sins, in my flesh nature, but I will stand in there in you, because of the new birth of Christ in me. If Christ is in you, the Bible says that you are no longer under the law, under the law of Moses, which gives, which makes you a sinner. If you are under the law, trying to keep the commandments to be good, you're going to go to hell. What is the new commandment Christ gave you? This is the command that he gave us, that you must believe on the name or the authority of the only begotten son of God. What was his authority? He was given the authority to lay down his life for you and to take it up again to give you his free gift of eternal life you don't pay for it by promising to be good because you can't be good there is none that doeth good jesus christ said there is none good but god are you god then yeah. you're not good uh does god create evil yes he does he says i create good i create evil god creates evil he created you didn't he, yeah. he said, you being evil Know how yeah. to give good gifts to your children. So yeah, again, well. our being is evil. So we have to, Lord, save us from our sins. So if this is sin and I'm a sinner and he comes and saves me from my sins because I believe in him, do I have sin? No. He gave me his righteousness. He took away my sin, washed it away by his what? 
What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but his resurrection. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other help I know. You can't even help yourself. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says we are saved by grace through faith in his blood, not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of us working, trying to be good, lest we boast. We don't, we have nothing to boast about. All we boast, if any man boasts, let him boast where? In the Lord. The Lord. In the Lord. I'm not a good person. I'm not a good person. Your phone, please. What's good about me? Christ in me. We do not preach ourselves. We preach who? We preach Christ and him crucified. That's it. So to be saved, the Bible says, Romans 10, 9 and 10, what must you do to be saved? You must confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. So repeat after me. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And you must have works. Your, and your works don't work. He's, here's the works that save you. You must believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Did you raise Jesus from the dead? No. And your works don't work. Do you have to have God's work? This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom God has sent, who raised Jesus from the dead. Do you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead? I believe. Yes. The, the yeah, Bible yeah. says you've been saved with eternal salvation eternal redemption, and given eternal life. Does that make you a good person? No. no. Does that change your sexual orientation? No. No. Does that improve you in any way, shape, or form? No. <laughs> what does that? Getting into the book and renewing your mind with the word of God so you can see how God wants you to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world by Christ who lives in you. Are there any questions of tonight's lesson? No questions? Well, God bless you and keep you. Uh, Leon, do you want to close it out in prayer tonight? Yes, I sure will. Thank you, Brother James. You're welcome. Father God, thank you for the serving. Father, I want you to keep us safe. Keep our family safe over the rest of the week, Heavenly Father, and educate us more and more each day of your word and continue, Heavenly Father, to give us strength. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. And thank you for the great word. You're welcome. Have a great week, everyone. Take care, everybody.